Like some other pieces of jewelry, this diamond tiara has been called cursed. To be honest, I don't really believe in curses. But learning about the history of this diamond tiara makes my blood run cold. Regardless of whether you believe in evil fate or not, I think my story today will not leave you indifferent. I talked a bit about this Cartier diamond tiara in one of my past videos. Its story captured my mind so much that I couldn't stop thinking about it. For several days I was mentally replaying the events of bygone days, imagining myself in the place of the owner of the tiara and thinking a lot about her tragic fate. So I wanted to record another video fully dedicated to Lady Allen's tiara, which miraculously escaped a watery grave. Before we start, please support my channel by clicking the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you. This story begins in Montreal in 1909. Sir Hugh Montagu Allen was a wealthy Canadian businessman and he needed a gift for his wife Marguerite. By the way, the Allen family was well known not only in Canada, but also abroad for their various business ventures, which included shipping, hotels, banks, rubber, coal and paper manufacturing. These ventures elevated them to the upper echelons of society, both in their home country and in Montagu's father's homeland of Great Britain. In 1971, Queen Victoria granted a knighthood to Montagu's father, shipping magnate Sir Hugh Allen. King Edward VII's letter knighted Montagu in 1906 and further honored him in 1907 by appointing him a commander of the Royal Victorian Order. The knighthood meant that Marguerite Allen would henceforth be referred to simply as Lady Allen. Being the wife of such a prominent man, Marguerite required many impressive outfits and jewelry to attend various social gatherings. Of course, the number one piece of jewelry was the tiara. So in 1909, Sir Hugh Montagu Allen ordered a diamond, a pearl manda tiara from Cartier. The jewelry is in the Greek style, fashionable at the time, but is distinguished by a detachable diamond with a band of brilliant cut diamonds and an impressive setting studded with pearls. It is not inferior to royal jewelry, although it did not belong to the royal family. Marguerite sees numerous occasions to showcase her new tiara. The society pages abound with mentions of the Allen's presence at galas, parties and performances, often detailing Marguerite's exquisite jewels and attire. In 1911, for instance, she graced the grand drawing room hosted in Ottawa by the Royal Governor General and his wife, the Duke and Duchess O'Connor. The report noted, Lady Allen, Montreal, white satin, brocaded in gold, draped with lace, diamonds, orchids. On another memorable night at the opera that same year, attended by the Connaughts and Princess Patricia, Margaret, captivated in the tiara, as described in the report. Sir Montagu Allen's party included Lady Allen, wearing black and silver striped satin, with a black velvet girdle a diamond head trimming, diamond tiara. In 1914, World War I broke out. The Allens were overseas in Canada at the time, but were still embroiled in the conflict. Sir Montagu was appointed Lieutenant Colonel of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. The Allen couple's eldest children, daughter Martha and son Hugh, ended up in Britain and also took part in the war effort. Martha went to Europe in 1915 to work as a nurse and Hugh served first in the Canadian Black Watch, Royal Highland Regiment, and then in the Royal Naval Air Service. Sir Montagu was also preparing to leave for Britain in the spring of 1915. In consultation, the Allens decided that Margaret and her younger daughters Anna, 16 years old, and Gwendolyn, 15 years old, should also go to England so that the whole family could be together during the difficult years of war. The couple also planned to open a military hospital, 
drawing on the experience and connections Montagu had gained as president of the Montreal General Hospital, leaving her husband to complete his business in Quebec. Margaret Allen, accompanied by her daughters and two maids, boarded the Lusitania on May 1, 1915. The three Allens were traveling in first class with two maids, Emily Davis and Annie Walker. The waters through which the Lusitania was sailing had already been declared a war zone by Germany at the time. The Germans threatened to torpedo any ship that might be in these waters. The German Imperial Embassy in Washington posted a warning to this effect under an advertisement for the Lusitania's return voyage on the day of her departure. But the passengers thought they were safe, for the liner was very fast. You might say that the shipping company was counting on the Lusitania to get a quickie through. The Allens, of course, must have been aware of the danger. After all, they were well versed in the intricacies of sea travel, having owned and operated the Allen shipping line for two generations. Apparently, too, the Allens believed that the ship's speed would allow it to sail through unharmed. Margaret took with her some twenty suitcases containing enough clothes, jewelry and personal items to feed herself during her long stay abroad. A Cartier tiara lay in one of the suitcases. On May 7th, the passengers and crew of the Lusitania finally saw land. It was Ireland. Everyone was relieved. It was just over 20 kilometers to shore. Three women Allen and two maids had time to dine and rested in the living room of the ship at 2 hours and 10 minutes past midday forward looking on the bow of the Lusitania, noticed a thin foam trail stretching to the ship. A German submarine fired on the Lusitania and a torpedo crashed into the side of the ocean liner. A second explosion inside the ship made it clear that the vessel was sinking and very quickly. It took 18 minutes for the ship to go completely underwater. In the midst of chaos, the Allens and their fellow passengers urgently deliberated on strategies for survival. Amidst the frenzy, they frantically searched for live vests. It appears that at some point, either Emily or Annie ventured back to the family suite, sifting through the numerous trunks packed by Marguerite. There, they located the Cartier tiara. According to a survivor, both maids returned with live vests and were present with the family on the deck as the ship descended. The Lusitania tilted rapidly to starboard, which meant that the dinghies could only be lowered from one side, and that with great difficulty. Marguerite, Anna, Gwen, Emily and Annie collectively entered the water, making an effort to remain together amidst the chaos. It is said that Marguerite tightly held onto Anna's hand. However, amid the tumultuous sinking, the two Allen girls became separated from the rest of the group, likely due to the suction caused by the massive ocean liner going down. Marguerite suffered significant injuries, with a broken collarbone and a crushed thigh. Emily and Annie successfully stayed by Marguerite's side amid the ensuing chaos. Remarkably, one of them managed to retain the Cartier tiara throughout the entire ordeal. The trio was rescued from the water by the men aboard a cargo streamer, the SS Westboro. Through the combined efforts of fellow survivors and responding rescue ships, a total of 764 individuals out of the ship's 1,962 passengers were saved. Unfortunately, Gwen and Anna Allen did not survive. Gwen's body was discovered following the ship's sinking and Anna's remains were never found. Marguerite underwent a period of recovery in an Irish hospital, where she was later joined by Sir Montagu. However, her convalescence extended over several months. Turning her grief into proactive endeavors, Lady Allen engaged in various wartime relief activities in England. 
A special cable to the Montreal Gazette in January 1916 highlighted her involvement. Lady Montego Allen, who is residing at Folkestone, is diligently tending to the wounded in local hospitals, often taking groups of them for drives or to attend moving picture shows. Through all the conflict, the Allens remain deeply committed to war relief endeavors, with Sir Montagu actively contributing to the establishment of a pension system. There was another tragedy ahead for the Allen family. As the Allens' only son, Hugh, was shut down over the English Channel during his inaugural service flight in July 1917, Lady Allen and the Cartier Tiara returned safely home to Montreal in 1919 and she continued to wear jewelry in portraits and ceremonial events for the next few decades. Having outlived her entire children, Margaret Tiara transitioned into the possession of her cousin, Elspeth Patterson Dowes, upon her demise in 1957. Subsequently, Davis passed it down to her granddaughter, Elspeth Born Straker. In a significant turn of events, Coincident with the sanctional commemoration of the Lusitania's tragic sinking in 2015, Elspeth Born Straker opted to part ways with Alan's tiara, consigning it to a Sotheby's auction, where it fetched an impressive $868,000. The buyer at this auction was jewelry house Cartier, which now reverently preserves the tiara within its collection of historic jewels. After the sale, the tiara once again appeared in public. It was presented at the special exhibition Ocean Liners Speed and Style at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London in 2018. Thank you for watching this video. Share your impressions in the comments and support our channel by subscribing and liking. Thank you.